You can go to Judges chapter 19. This evening we'll be looking at the first 21 verses. Give everyone a chance to get there. Starting in verse 1. The heading is a Levite and his concubine. In those days, when there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite was journeying in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, who took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. And his concubine was unfaithful to him. And she went away from him to her father's house, house at Bethlehem in Judah and was there some four months. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back. He had with him his servant and a couple of donkeys and she brought him, and she brought him into her father's house. And when the girl's father saw him, he came with joy to meet him. And his father-in-law, the girl's father, made him stay. And he remained with him three days, so they ate and drank and spent the night there. On the fourth day they arose early in the morning, and he prepared to go. But the girl's father said to his son-in-law, Strengthen your heart with a morsel of bread, after that you may go. So the two of them sat and ate and drank together. And the girl's father said to the man, Be pleased to spend the night, and let your heart be merry. And when the man rose up to go, his father-in-law pressed him till he spent the night there again. On the fifth day, he arose early in the morning to depart. And the girl's father said, Strengthen your heart and wait until the day declines. So they ate, both of them. And when the man and his concubine and his servant rose up to depart, his father-in-law, the girl's father, said to him, Behold, now the day has waned towards evening. Please spend the night. Behold, the day draws to its close. Lodge here and let your heart be merry, and tomorrow you shall arise early in the morning for your journey and go home. But the man would not spend the night. He, arose, he rose up and departed and arrived opposite Jebus, that is, Jerusalem. He had with him a couple of saddled donkeys, and his concubine was with him. When they were near Jebus, the day was nearly over, and the servant said to his master, Come now, let us turn aside to the city of the Jebusites and spend the night in it. And his master said to him, We will not turn aside into the city of foreigners who do not belong to the people of Israel, but we will pass on to Gibeah. And he said to his young man, Come and let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night at Gibeah or Ramah. So they passed on and went their way. And the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. And they turned aside there to go in and spend the night at Gibeah. And he went in and sat down in the open square of the city, for no one took them into his house to spend the night. And behold, an old man was coming from his work in the field at evening. The man was from the hill country of Ephraim, and he was journeying in Gibeah. The men of the place were Benjamites. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, Where are you going? And where do you come from? And he said to him, We are passing from Bethlehem into Judah to the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, from which I come. I went to Bethlehem in Judah, and I am going to the house of the Lord. But no one has taken me into his house." We have straw and feed for our donkeys with bread and wine for me and your female servant and the young man with your servant. There is no lack of anything. And the old man said, Peace be to you. I will care for all your, all your wants. Only do not spend the night in the square. So he brought him into the house and gave the donkeys feed. And they washed their feet and ate and drank. Let's pray and then we'll look at this passage. Lord, we thank you for your word. Um, we know that as we make our way into this final narrative of, of the book of Judges, that this, this narrative starts fairly tame. 
but it ramps up very quickly. And we see the depravity of the nation of Israel. Lord, our society isn't much different. Please, Lord, be gracious to us. Please speak to us through your word. Please remind us that the solution to the world's problems, it isn't social programs and things like that. It's ultimately you. It is people bowing the knee and worshipping you. Please remind us of that. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, I don't want to get too philosophical, but before we get to the text for today, I'd like to define one philosophical term. That term is humanism. What is humanism? Once we understand what it means, you'll see how it fits in today's sermon and most likely all of our sermons until the end of the book that Colin and I will be doing together. Humanism is defined simply from two sources that I use. The one is from the Oxford Dictionary. It says, a rationalist outlook or system of thought. So basically, it's a worldview. Attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. Let me repeat that. Attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. So humanism is having a greater concern for making our lives better in the present, making sure that we are comfortable this side of eternity as opposed to worrying about what will happen to us after we die, generally understood to, to be in the realm of religion. These humanists often use the following cliché to describe religious folk. They are so heavenly minded that they are of no earthly good. As Christians, we must admit that there are times we are guilty of this wrong way of thinking ourselves. The second definition comes from the Bristol Humanist Group. So in other words, the horse's mouth. Defining humanism in relation to morality. They say, humanism is an approach to life based on reason. Not a religious text, reason. And our common humanity. Recognizing that moral values are properly founded on human nature and experience alone. Not some external source, not God. As as humans decide what is moral or immoral. Here we see that humanism te teaches that morals come from us as humans, not a higher power. Therefore, many people care more about what the world deems to be moral or immoral instead of what the Bible has to say about these things. What was wrong with Israel in the time of the judges? Humanism. This way of thinking. Because in chapters 17 to 21, the following phrase is repeated four times. In Judges 17 verse 6, 18 verse 1, 19 verse 1, and 21 verse 25. More than any other phrase in this section. Indicating that it's the main theme of this section of the book. The phrase is, in those days when there was no king in Israel. And what is the result of this lack of a king? Meaning no fear of God, no external authority telling us what to do. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Everyone decided what was right or wrong by himself. According to Judges 17 verse 6 and 21 verse 25. Today we are going to make our way through Judges 19 from verses 1 to 21, and the account begins with, in those days when there was no king in Israel. Strongly implying that everything that, that will follow will show how everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now let's begin studying this final narrative in the book of Judges, which Colin and I have divided up into four 
sermons. We hope it'll only be four sermons. By looking at the first section of this narrative, and then we'll spend the rest of our time applying the text. So let's look at the text itself. A godless and inhospitable society. A godless and inhospitable society. In verse 1, we're introduced to a Levite that was temporarily living in the hill country of Ephraim. A sojourner. Most likely he was probably in that area to be close to Shiloh. Because that's where the tabernacle was set up. Making it the center of Israelite religion. And you'll see later in the text, that's where he returns to. We're told that he, at, in his journeys he met a woman in Bethlehem, in Judah. And he took her to be his concubine. A concubine was a sort of lesser wife with less privileges, which is why she's referred to as his wife, even though she's, she's not technically his wife in, in that Jewish culture. In verse 2, we are told that at some, at some point, his concubine left him and went to stay with her father again. In the English Standard Version, it states that she was unfaithful, but that most likely wasn't the case. Or she would have been put to death according to, to the law. You just have to see Deuteronomy 22, verse 22. Anyone who committed adultery, male or female, was usually put to death. The word translated as unfaithful could also convey the idea that she was in conflict with the Levite and left him without necessarily committing adultery. Just listen to how the the, the New American Standard Bible trans translates this passage. But his concubine found him repugnant and she left him. The idea is that she was sick of him and she left. What happened between them, though, is irrelevant. And we must be careful of making moral judgments about this Levite or his concubine based on what happens after this. Because the author just wanted to set the scene for what happens next. We are told that she stayed with her dad for four months. In verse 3, we are told that the Levite wanted to see his concubine and convince her to return to him. Again, giving the idea that there was no adultery involved. So he made his way to Bethlehem to, to speak with her. He arrived at her father's house, and his father-in-law must have been happy to see him. Most likely because he longed to see his daughter reunited with her husband. We're told in verse 4 that he was welcomed into his father-in-law's father home, and he stayed there for three days. For three days, the two men feasted together. Then in verses 5 to 7, we are told that on the fourth day, the Levite was up early to embark on his journey and to return to the hill country of Ephraim, to return to what was most likely Shiloh, only for his father-in-law to offer him breakfast. He accepted, and before he knew it, he could no longer travel because it was too late. In those days, you didn't travel at night unless you had a death wish. He was determined to leave, nonetheless, but in the end his father-in-law convinced him to stay another night. In verses 8 to 10a, the first part of verse 10, we are told what happened on day 5. The Levite again woke up early to leave and was offered breakfast again. And he accepted again. The way to this guy's heart was obviously food. They lost track of time again and it was too late to travel. There was obviously some urgency for the Levite to get back home though. And despite the dangers of leaving on their journey so late now he was like, I have to go. I have no choice. 
despite his father-in-law's appeals for him to stay with him again. In the second part of verse 10 to verse 13, we are told of a conversation between the Levite and his servant. They passed a city called Jebus, which would one day be Jerusalem. David conquered it. You can see that in 2 Samuel 5. His servant suggested that they find refuge in, in the walls of Jebus. But the Levite wouldn't do so because the inhabitants were foreigners. They were the Jebusites. It wouldn't be a stretch to assume that he was wary of the immoral behavior of the Jebusites. He viewed them as pagans. And he was like, those people will be immoral. And this is an important theme because we're going to see that Israel is more immoral. And didn't believe that they'd be safe in this immoral city. The Levite thought it would be safer for them to push on to the Israelite cities of Gibeah or Ramah. Even if they arrived when the sun was going down. In verses 14 to 15 we are told that they arrived at Gibeah eventually in the evening and made camp in the open square of the city. This happened because the people of Benjamin, the inhabitants of Gibeah, refused to show hospitality to this Levite and those traveling with him. Why would they be so inhospitable? That you understand it in some cultures, but th this was a hospitable culture. Could it have been that their society had become so corrupt that they trusted nobody anymore? Does that sound like a culture you know of? Could it have been that they feared what would happen to them if they did show hospitality to this Levite? Maybe they knew what would happen if they were kind to this person. Wait for the next section of this narrative. Finally, in verses 16 to 21, we are told of an old man, also from the hill country of Ephraim, the same area as the Levite, who was returning home after a long day's work. Knowing that it was late and seeing this group of people camped in the city square, he went to inquire about what they were doing there. The Levite told the old man that they were on their way back to Shiloh and hoped the old man would, that he'd take them in, mentioning that he had everything he needed to provide for himself. He wasn't asking, you know, he wasn't begging. He just needed somewhere to stay. He would pay his own way. He'd make it worth the old man's while. The old man, in contrast to the inhabitants of Gibeah, the other inhabitants of Gibeah, with great urgency said he would take them in and provide for all of their needs. But they just mustn't stay in the city square. The reason for his urgency will be crystal clear when we tackle the next section of this account. So the old man took them in, fed the donkeys, cleaned them up, and gave them food and drink. We're going to end here on a, at a, in a peaceful place. But what happens next is far from that. In a society where the hospitality of strangers could be the difference between life and death, the people of Israel, of Benjamin in particular, had failed this Levite and his traveling party. Praise the Lord for people like this old man. Whatever happens next. Because what happens next is horrific. With that, let's apply this passage under the heading, What we learn from the hospitality or lack of hospitality experienced by this Levite. Let's begin with application one. Beware of being overly hospitable. Beware of being overly hospitable. We see in today's account the Levite being entertained by his father-in-law, which is lovely. And his father-in-law should be commended for being 
a good host. But unfortunately, his hospitality went too far. And it led to the death of his daughter. As you'll see when we continue. This Levite clearly had an urgent need to get back to his home. And every time he tried to leave, his father-in-law would try to entice him to stay. And we could also question whether this father-in-law should have been hospitable to his daughter for four months. I'm not saying he should have kicked her out, but maybe he should have said, my girl, reconcile with your husband. I'll take you back there. As opposed, as opposed to just letting her stay there for four months. He seemed pretty keen to have them reunited. Because of this man being overly hospitable and the Levite not being able to say no, he has to take responsibility too. The Levite arrived in Gibeah late. The party which included his daughter were placed in a, danger, in a dangerous predicament. And his daughter eventually died because of this. The point of hospitality was the protection of the traveler. In that culture... And his attempts to keep his son-in-law and daughter around longer than they should have led to, him, led to him placing them in harm's way. Keep this in mind when you entertain. If you know that somebody is susceptible to giving in to pressure, don't pressure them into staying. Especially if that person is leaving because they have a pressing matter or because of a safety issue. If someone has come to visit you and eventually must leave to get to a doctor's appointment, to visit another person, to get home while it's still light, or because they just need rest, or for any, no any number of reasons, don't pressure them to stay. This kind of pressure could come via playful teasing, making someone feel guilty for going, saying things like, you know, no one ever comes to visit me anymore. Acting as though you didn't hear them say that they need to leave. Or simply pressuring them to miss their next appointment. It doesn't really matter, I'm more important. When you do this, you show that you don't have respect for that person's time or for the time of the person that they are trying to get to. It may not result, result in death, most likely won't, like in this account. But it could cost them a business deal, or cause them to wait another two months to see a doctor or a specialist that they desperately need to see. The reason so many people that long to entertain, to be visited, get visited so little, is because people are wary. If they do go visit... They won't make their next appointment because they know this person doesn't let them go. If people believe that you respect their time and can leave with minimal fuss, you may become a far more popular place to hang around at. And FYI, many of these principles apply to visitors as well. You could swap them around. Let's move on to the second application. A failure to be, application two, a failure to be hospitable is sin. A failure to be hospitable is sin. And as I say that, when we speak of hospitality, that doesn't just say coming into someone's home. It can also be you seeing that someone needs help and you going into their home and providing it. It can also mean taking someone out. In Asia, people's houses are so small, they don't entertain in their homes. They entertain outside of their home. So it's not exclusively in homes, although in our culture that's probably where the context is most accurate. As I start, I just want to acknowledge that some people have more of a gift for being hospitable than other people. But it must be acknowledged that it is the responsibility of all Christians to be hospitable, even if it isn't your gift. You just read 1 Peter 
4 verse 9. And I'll quote it in a bit. Some people may be able to have people in their homes 24-7. And if that's you, good for you. While others are more private and maybe should only open their homes perhaps once a week for guests. At least initially. So as I expand on the Christian mandate to be hospitable, I'm not saying to you, remove your doors and allow the world to come into your home. I'm definitely not saying that. Gibeah, as a society, had become so godless, you'll see why, that a Levite, a respected religious leader in that culture, and those traveling with him needed protection, And nobody offered it until this old man comes into the picture. The city square clearly wasn't a safe place to set up camp. You see Judges 19 verse 20. And nobody even warned this Levite. Nobody said to this Levite, Buddy, you know, I'm not taking you into my house, but get out of here now. Because you're not safe. Nobody did that to him. This man was oblivious to the danger that he was in. You just have to read on if you want to see why. Listen to what Peter wrote in a series of commands for all Christians. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. If we fail to do this, we are ignoring a clear command from God's word. If God tells us to do something and we don't do it, that's sin. Now, instead of turning your house into a commune, some people, when they hear something like this, they overreact. They overcorrect. And then they overwhelm themselves and then they revert back to their bad prior behavior. So so don't do that. Don't overcorrect. Don't turn your house into a commune. Look at how much you are currently being hospitable. If it's zero, look at that say, that's a problem, I need to sort that out. If it's one day a week, look at that say, can I improve on that? Think about it. So look at how much you are currently being hospitable. Make a budget for how much time and money you have to offer. Both of those things. And also social energy that you have to offer. It's called being deliberate. So may, think about it. Think, how much can I offer? How much time? How much money? How, many, you know, how long does it take until I'm absolutely exhausted in social events? And then invite people into your home, or if you don't have a home, at least meet someone somewhere and take them out for coffee or do something with them. This is how beautiful friendships are built, and it's a command from the Lord. Don't neglect it, and that applies to all of us sitting here. Let's move on to our final application, which is application three. Hospitality requires wisdom. Hospitality requires wisdom. Now, as you'll see, when we continue with this account, We could also say that the old man was overly hospitable. He does something horrible in Judges 19, verse 23 to 24. But we'll deal with his sinful behavior next time. What I do want you to see, though, is that the old man didn't simply offer accommodation to these strangers. He did more than that. You can see he actually questioned them in Judges 19, verse 17. He first questioned them to find out what they were doing in the city square, where they were coming from and where they were going. It was late and he saw somebody that was either a victim waiting to happen or trouble. It was one of those two things. If someone was sitting in that that city square, it was either trouble or it was a victim waiting to happen. He bravely and selflessly engaged with them instead of just assuming the worst. That's good. And after making an educated judgment, he welcomed them in. We are not to be hospitable to just anyone and everyone. Just read 2 John. There's, if you want to read books about hospitality, 2 and 3 John. 2 John's about 
don't be hospitable to these people. And then three, John is about now you're not being hospitable when you should be. Just read two John and John chapter six, where people are like, Jesus, give us food. And he's like, I'm not giving you food anymore. Now you're just coming for the food and now I'm not going to feed you anymore. Many people have embraced the idea that they should always help the down and out without question and have put their families in danger. Many people have embraced the idea that you should give a guest all they ask for and have found themselves in a financial mess. I know of situations where people have just given everything away to everybody else and then they, they've gone bankrupt and their family haven't had food. Hospitality requires wisdom. Some people will say after extending hospitality and, and, and somebody, to somebody in the church and that person abusing them, abusing that hospitality, they'll say, but man, I met him or her at the church. Not realizing that the craftiest con men and women target Christians and know just enough of the Bible to make them feel guilty. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when being hospitable, be prayerful and be deliberate. Don't just wait for it to come to you, because then the con men will come to you. Be prayerful and be deliberate. Don't write off hospitality just because there's a world out there full of people that want a, a, you know, a piece of the pie. Don't write it off just because some people abuse your kindness. But instead, identify someone in the church you believe needs hospitality. Whether that is because of loneliness, maybe bad life decisions, whatever, the many, any number of things. Ask a few people about the character of that person if you are uncertain of them. If you've met them, you've got to know them, you've figured it out, you think they're all right, that's fine. If you're uncertain, maybe ask one or two people that have had run-ins with them and they'll say, no, that, that guy, stay away. Then perhaps stay away. And then be as hospitable as you can be responsibly. Today's account wasn't ultimately about hospitality, though. The main point of Judges 19 to 21 is that Israel needed a king. That's why this account begins with that phrase, Judges 19 verse 1, and this same account ends with it in Judges 21 verse 25. It, it's a sandwich. Israel embraced a philosophy, humanism. They embraced a worldview that taught heavenly matters are of secondary importance. They embraced a worldview that human reason is all we need to understand the world. We don't need wisdom from outside of us. We don't need wisdom that comes from a, a god, an authority, an all-knowing an, an omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God. We don't need that. We are God. We will figure out our own morals. See where the world is today, and you'll understand that. That's what they embraced. They did whatever they wanted, whatever their heart wanted. And they embraced a worldview they, they didn't need anybody to tell them what was right or wrong. They could figure it out for themselves. Today we have the same problem. We all need a king. Someone who will provide for us when we seek his kingdom first. Matthew 6 verse 33. Someone who created the world and knows how it works exhaustively. John 1 verse 2. And someone who tells us what to do and we obey. John 14 verse 15. We don't decide for ourselves what's best. 
Only Jesus fits this description. And you need him. Our world needs him. And despite being of greater value than any of us, Jesus died to save sinners like us. If we simply repent of our self-dependence, the, the, the spirit of the world, and, our, and ask him to forgive us and put our faith in him. Do you want to keep on worshipping yourself or human reason or some other finite creature? If so, then you have already embraced destruction. John 3 verse 18 says, those who, re- who, who don't believe have already embraced destruction. But there's another option. Are you going to beg Jesus to forgive you for your sinful worldview? For doing whatever you pleased, whenever you wanted to? For your sinful self indulgence and self-reliance and then are you going to trust in him as both your savior he'll save you from hell and judgment and lord you need both he who can tell you what to do as well let's pray Lord, we thank you for your word. Uh, We thank you that your word gives us insight into our own culture. We pray, Lord, that um, if there's anybody here that um, doesn't have you as their king, that you would change that. And Lord, we we come to you today and, and we know, Lord, that the things of this world quickly distract us. And um, we don't, as Christians, always seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Sometimes we are distracted by the things of this world and we neglect the weighty matters that you want us to, to pay attention to. Please be gracious to us. Please forgive us. And Lord, please help us to live a life that is pleasing to you. We can't do it in our own strength. We desperately need your help. Amen.